So during my high school years, I learned the art of uh, judging, manipulating, controlling. See, I grew up in a household with a brother who was three years older than me. And in high school, he carried the label of the quote-unquote the bad kid. And he was in and out of trouble, in and out of the county jail, battled drug and alcohol addiction. And, and so in my need to control him, because in my mind, he was bringing shame into our good Christian family. So in my need to control him, I remember in, in high school having conversations with him like, dude, do you not see what you're doing? I mean, if you could just stop doing this, and if you could start doing this, and, and don't you see what you're doing to mom? And see, when that wouldn't work, when that form of control wouldn't work, like we do, y'all know how it is, we woo people in through the positive, you know what I mean? Bro, it's just that you're, you know, you're like the best of the siblings. How are you the smartest, and you're the brightest, and, and you're kind, and that's why it's so heartbreaking to see it go down this way. And see, when that doesn't work, when our methods of control, when they don't work, we usually just get more and more absurd, don't we? One Friday night, he was off at a party, and it was me and a buddy of mine from the youth group. And when he left, we went into his bedroom, and we gathered up all of his belongings that we didn't approve of, in the name of Jesus, of course. It, different t-shirts, certain CDs, y'all remember the days of compact discs? Yeah, different uh, containers that would hold certain items. We gathered up all those belongings and we put them in a barrel. Then we carried this barrel upstairs outside the front door and into the middle of the street where we poured gasoline on it. And we burned those items. But see, the problem was my brother got home early the next morning. I was still sleeping. He storms into my room. Where's my stuff? I jump out of bed. I said, your stuff's in ashes. What do you mean my stuff's in ashes? In the name of Jesus, we burned your stuff. And then he did what big brothers do. And I received a bit of a pounding that morning. <laughs> Jesus says, do not give dogs what is holy and do not, do not throw your pearls to pigs because if you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, without context, this just is kind of bizarre, isn't it? It doesn't make much sense. But when we put this passage in its proper context, this passage is about surrendering others and trusting others to God's love and care. Do you trust God with the people in your life, or are you busy practicing the art of control, controlling them to get them to behave the way you think they should behave? Because, see, this passage is about you relinquishing your need to control. This passage is about you turning others over to God. In this passage, Jesus is asking the question, is there anyone you've been trying to control? Is there anyone you've been trying to manipulate? Is there anyone you need to set free? Now, this passage comes from somewhere. It comes from Matthew chapter 7, and what's interesting about Matthew chapter 7, some of y'all will remember this, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So this comes towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon that Jesus is giving in Matthew's gospel, it is a sermon essentially about uh, compassion and generosity and non-anxiousness and grace and non-violence, and it's about a new way of living in the world. And this line comes towards the end of Jesus' sermon. Now, in order to understand this thing, we have to understand the thing that comes before the thing, right? Because it's a sermon, and so that means there's movement to it. Jesus is building upon each of these points. He's headed somewhere. So chapter 6, the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, you get all this language of Jesus saying, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble on its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. And, and he talks about things like food and possessions and essentially the things that it takes to pay the bills and all the things that can keep us up at night, all the things that can keep us filled with anxiety. And Jesus' response is, don't worry. Don't worry about your life. And it's not a glib kind of don't worry. It's not a don't worry, be happy. It's, it's, it's this fundamental question of do you trust that God has you? And he says, look, look up in the air. Look at the birds. I mean, look out to, to, to the fields. 
Look to the lilies. Do you trust that God is taking care of you if God is taking care of them? Can you trust it? Jesus is teaching us to commit ourselves into the care of God. And by the way, Jesus was not in the hypotheticals. We have to remember Jesus was always talking to real people in the real world, dealing with real joy, dealing with real suffering, dealing with everyday life events. And so this is very practical advice for a bigger perspective of your life because it's about living with less anxiety and more peace, less worry and more calm. Yeah, we need that, don't we? Then you get to chapter 7. And Jesus shifts. It goes from you now to others. And Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. So it's, yeah, it's about you living with less anxiety, less worry, less fear. And surrendering yourself. It begins with you, but then it turns to your relationship with others. And Jesus says, don't judge. Now this word judge, it's an interesting word because in the Greek, and keep in mind the New Testament is written in the Greek. In the Greek, it's this word krino, K-R-I-N-O. Say that word with me, krino. Yeah, krino is fascinating because there's three meanings to this word. And the first meaning is um, a legal setting, what happens in the courtroom. And that's important, right? We need a judicial system. But that's not what's happening in this passage. And then you have this second meaning of uh, literally to make a decision. And and, and you'll hear people say all the time, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to judge. I don't want to be judgmental. You're making judgments about your life all day, every day. I mean, when you woke up this morning, you had to make a judgment about whether you were going to get in in your car or on your bike or however you got here, if you were going to come to church this morning. We're always making judgments about our life, but that's not what this passage is talking about. There's a third meaning to Crino. And it's the thing that happens when you lower another in order to raise yourself. In other words, self-righteousness at the expense of others. Yeah, we've all been there, haven't we? I mean, at some point in our lives, we have stepped on the neck of someone else in order to raise ourselves. You've experienced this. You might have experienced the other end, too. How does it feel? Jesus keeps going. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And I hope you all see that what Jesus is doing here is what Jesus so often does. He's using this big, over-the-top language, this big imagery to make a point. Because, see, sometimes what we do is we try to control others. Hey, come here, let, let me get that speck out of your eye. Even though I can't get too close to you because I have a log coming out of my eye. Come here, let, let me get that speck out of your eye. Let me control you as a way of avoiding my own issues, my own pain. You know what I mean? You see, as long as you focus on them, you don't have to do the hard work with yourself. And Jesus is giving us that reminder. Don't focus on the flaws of another as a way of avoiding your own issues. See, and then we get that very next section, the, the, the verse that closes this section of the sermon. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs because if you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And do you see how chapter six, the middle of the sermon, is all about surrendering yourself to the care of God, to live in this non-anxious way and to have this kind of sustaining, abiding peace and serenity. And then the next section is all about what happens when you don't surrender others into the care of God, when you're not at peace with the path of others, because what do we do when we're not at peace with the path of others? We try to control them. We try to control them. Have you ever been stuck in the game of trying to control other people? Have you ever been controlled or manipulated? Maybe it's happening to you by someone right now. What does it feel like? How does it feel? 
You see, when I graduated high school, <clears throat> I went to this small Bible school, and this small Bible school is up in Michigan, and I'm from Missouri, and man, this was a, a, a very conservative, rigid, fundamentalist Bible school, lots and lots of rules, and um, it, it was one of those places where they uh, frowned on tattoos, and well, and they frowned upon most movies. Movies were immoral, and this was the year that um, the Matrix had, Matrix had come out. I wasn't allowed to see the Matrix. The Matrix is one of the most profound theological films of, of recent decades, and so this is the kind of school it was, and um, you know, it was my first month there. Many of you know this. It was my first month there that mom called me and said, you need to come home because your brother Brandon's been killed in a car accident, and you know, I finished out the semester I went home for the summer. I came back to the school for about a week and a half. And man, my life was just kind of a mess, if I'm honest, right? I mean, things were turned upside down. I was asking all kinds of questions. God wasn't really working for me. And so um, here I am sitting in Old Testament class. And the professor started rambling like he did. And five minutes into the class, I got this bright idea. I said, I'm going to leave. I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm just going to leave. And so I walked out of that class, and before that class was over, I had my car, my entire dorm room packed up and in my car. And literally, as I was putting my last box in the trunk, and I was closing the trunk, I look up, and the dean is right in my face. He said, where are you going? Bro, I'm leaving. What do you mean you're leaving? Like for the weekend? No, nah, man, I'm, I'm not coming back. And he said to me, well, you can't just leave. Now, in my infinite wisdom, and in my, perhaps my grief and my immaturity, I think I responded with something like, <clears throat> watch me. <laughs> and I got my car and left. And for a couple weeks after, the dean was calling me, and he was trying to woo me back in, and he was saying things like this. Ryan, you know, it's just that you're one of our finest students. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, if I'm one of your finest students, I'm like a solid B minus at this time, and my life is a disaster. If I'm one of your finest students, you've got a big problem on your hands. <laughs> and so, but the more he tried, the further I would run. The more he tried, the further I would go. And towards the end of my college career, when I became a, a United Methodist, I had, oh. <laughs> you said it. When I became a United Methodist and I, I, I made a departure from my evangelical upbringing, I had people in my upbringing say to me, you know you're leaving God, right? You know you're turning your back on God. And you know God sees this. And you know God is a just God. And then when I graduated seminary, and I made the decision, and I was excited about this decision that I was going to become a United Methodist pastor, and I was going to start the ordination process. I'll never forget what someone in my upbringing said to me, someone that I had a great deal of respect for. They said, man, and we thought you were going to be a great leader in the church, but now. And it was like that crushing moment, you know? And you wanted to say, gee, you know, just a simple congratulations would have worked too. <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff that sent me into therapy. Because for so long, I thought I was like letting down my people. For so long, I thought I was a great disappointment to my tribe. And it took me some years to figure out that those methods and comments like that, they are always built on fear and anxiety and manipulation and control. And see, what I've since learned is that when you leave a system or when you disrupt a system, it doesn't matter what system, a family system, a religious system, when you leave or disrupt it, it'll always be difficult because systems are always built on self-preservation. They always bend towards self-preservation. You know what I mean? You see, if we're not at peace with the path of others, we can behave in some pretty unhealthy and absurd ways, can't we? And I think Jesus was picking up on this in his sermon. And y'all, I can't tell you how many conversations I've been a part of that start with something like, well, how do I get them to, how do I get my son or daughter to, how do I get my mom to stop? How do I get this colleague of mine to start? How do I... And I wish I had this simple answer years ago. My, today, my answer is very simple to people. You can't. Sorry, but you, you can't. 
You can only control you and your response. You cannot control the other people. And some of y'all say, yeah, but I mean, you got to understand, I, I know the path that they're on and I know where this path leads. And yeah, I know it's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes they're on a path that is completely filled with self-destruction and you might actually have some answers. You might actually have some solutions and some of your solutions are good. But when you become manipulative, when you become controlling, you are wasting your energy, and God has only given you so much energy. You are giving sacred things to dogs, and you're throwing your pearls to pigs, and you're expecting a good outcome. You're expecting them to do something meaningful with your pearls, and it doesn't work, does it? My brothers and sisters, have you been trying to control and manipulate others to get them to behave the way you want them to behave? And has it just produced in you more and more fear, more and more worry, more and more anxiety? There's a reason Jesus started with you first. Turn yourself over before you can turn others over. What would it look like for you to entrust them into God's loving care? To say, you know what? No longer my journey. It is their journey. It's no longer mine. It's theirs. And if you are right in the middle of this stuff, allow me to make a suggestion. Outside perspective is very, very, very important. You know, last week we were in Florida, in Daytona Beach, Florida. Spent a week on the beach. You know, New Smyrna Beach. Anyone know where New Smyrna Beach is? It's about eight to ten miles south of Daytona Beach, and I say that because uh, I found out last summer New Smyrna Beach was uh, labeled the shark attack capital of the world. <laughs> so we spent every day in the ocean swimming and playing in the waves, and all week long we didn't see a shark until Friday. We went upstairs, we left the ocean, left the beach, left the pool, went upstairs. We started, got showers, we started packing up our things. It was our last day. And me and my wife, Tammy, and my sister and, and the kids, we walked outside to the balcony. We were on the 11th floor overlooking the ocean and, and we're just kind of saying bye-bye to the ocean. And we all saw it at the same time about this six foot long dark shadow swimming down the coast, and then swimming back up the coast, just feet away from the people who were in the water. Now, my daughters see it, and what do you think they did? Shark! 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 I'm like, babies, you can't say that. You're going to cause chaos. we got to go down there. So we leave the condo. We get in the elevator. We go down 11 floors. We walk out to the beach, and by the time we had gotten out there, all the lifeguard sirens were going. The trucks were going up and down with their bullhorns, getting everyone out of the water, and, and we were standing on the sand, and people were coming out of the water, and they're like, what's going on? Did you see it? And I'm like, yeah, dude, I saw it. There was a shark, and it was like three feet from you, and it was making circles around you. It was going up and down. They couldn't see it because they were right in the middle of it. They were in the water. From the balcony, you could see it clear as day. If you're right in the middle of it, find people in the balconies. Find people that love you. Find people that you trust and get outside perspective because I promise you all, they can see things that you're not able to see. They can help you see things that you're not able to see. Now, make sure these people have your best interest at heart. And if they don't, seriously, when it comes to this stuff in your life, leave them in the dust. Do not go to them. Go to the people that you love and trust. Let them allow you to see the things you're not able to see. And you see, when we surrender ourselves to God, when we put ourselves in the loving care of God, it is an incredible experience of grace. And let me remind you, here at St. Luke's, we are people of grace. It is our very first principle. You saw it when you walked in this morning. And when you entrust others to the loving care of God, when you stop throwing your sacred things to dogs, when you stop giving your pearls to pigs, it is an incredible experience of grace when you turn them over and I get it, it's hard because these are people you love. 
It's hard to turn them over to God. But it's an incredible experience of grace. And we can always hear God saying, I got them. No, no, Ryan, I got them. I got them. I got you too. I got you. I got them. Amen.